This is a video clip for the course AEDT 1120U Foundations of Digital Teaching and Learning Technologies, which is offered by University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Title of this uh, video clip is Personal Computing Devices. It's all about the interface. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. Number one, how does a command line interface or a CLI differ from a graphical user interface or GUI? Number two, what features does an operating system need to have to be considered a GUI, a GUI? Number three, what commonalities and differences exist between Apple operating systems or OSs, Microsoft OSs, and open source OSs? And number four, what characteristics allow operating systems to be considered to be open source? The discussion that follows is not necessarily in chronological order, although the general flow will move from slide to slide uh, from the 1970s through to the turn of the century and beyond. In an earlier video clip, it was stated that interactions between humans and mainframe computers were primarily mediated using punch cards and paper tape. Later, with the introduction of terminals, it was possible to send a command to the memory cache prior to processing so that programs could be entered and run directly from the keyboard. Most of the early personal computers made use of this type of human, inter uh, human computer interaction, or HCI. And when Microsoft's Disk Operating System, or DOS, was created, the command line interface, CLI, became, became the de facto method of sending commands to the processing unit. The CLI requires the user to be familiar with and to memorize the commands. Consequently, newbies or newcomers to uh, computers found computers with a CLI to be very difficult to operate and rather limited in terms of overall functionality. Please see a comparison of CLI and GUI as found in Apple Macintosh OS and Microsoft o uh, Windows, and that can be found at the link that is found on the bottom of this particular slide. As an example of how these interfaces were married to hardware, we'll look briefly at a series of devices. As suggested in an earlier video clip, Moore's Law seems to have an appreciable effect as the generations of hardware provide a platform upon which to create increasingly sophisticated software. Over time, operating systems interfaces became increasingly more user-friendly. Terminology such as natural and intuitive started to creep into the usability descriptions, although the use of the type of this terminology is ambiguous at best. For instance, what is natural about pressing a key on a keyboard to get a uh, particular letter to show up on a screen? The Xerox, as in the photocopier company, um, Alto, uh, circa 1973, was perhaps the first personal computer ever designed. It used the desktop metaphor and had a mouse-driven, semi-graphical user interface which required the use of commands to be entered from time to time. The computer consisted of a black-and-white cathode ray tube, CRT. Uh, think about old-fashioned televisions with a huge tube that uh, is in the center of the cabinet itself. The Alto also had a detachable keyboard, a three-button mouse, and a small refrigerator-sized cabinet that housed the processing unit and a whopping 2.5 megabyte hard disk. Take a look at the brief video clip that's referenced on the slide. The given description is noteworthy for a number of statements, specifically the what you see on the screen is what you get on your printer declaration. This is an early uh, reference to YCWIG or W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G um, and in the coming def decades this concept plays an increasingly important role. Early personal computers were developed primarily in a kit format that was similar to that amateur ham and crystal radio sets were available. Some of the more popular kits that you can find referenced on the internet are the Altair 8800 and the Heathkit H8. These kits could be ordered through the mail and they would be used by individuals who had an interest in dabbling with electronics. Many of these machines were built around central processing units and transistors that had recently become available. Markets for computers developed as they became more capable and as their usefulness in accomplishing tasks increased. Retail stores which sold a variety of computers began to appear. Among the first personal computers to appear for commercial availability were the Atari, which is currently primarily a gaming console, 
and a variety of machines from Commodore, including the PET, the VIC-20, which relied on a tape drive system, the Commodore 64, and the Amiga. I'm including reference to the Commodore machines since my first computer was a Commodore 64. The computer essentially was a plastic box which held a keyboard that was seated above the motherboard with proprietary, i.e. made by Commodore CPU, 64 kilobytes of RAM or random access memory, half of which was used for the proprietary operating system, the video controller chip which could produce 128 co colors, and a sound chip that was revolutionary at the time. I attached my C64, as we called them, to a color monitor, which doubled as my first color television. It had a pair of uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives and a dot matrix printer. My primary software, in addition to an assortment of games and utilities, was a word processor program called Paperclip. All of this was available for approximately $750 back in 1984. The system was a huge asset in my work as a high school teacher, making my portable manual typewriter obsolete overnight. There were severe restrictions, however, on the use of the computer. These included having to continually swap disks, which could only hold a limited amount of data and or coded software, and the 64 kilobytes of RAM also required the linking of files, each of which could not exceed approximately four pages of textual content. However, I continued to use the system until I upgraded to an IBM XT clone with a built-in 10 megabyte hard drive when these became available a couple of years later. The first Apple computer in 1976 was built as a kit machine, but it came partially assembled and was available for purchase through a shop for hobbyists. Headquarters for the Apple Computer Company was Steve Jobs' parents' garage, where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak designed and built the machines. The Apple II computer in 1977 was mass-produced using a plastic housing that had a removable lid, which allowed access to the motherboard and a series of slots which supported the addition of daughter boards that provided peripheral device functionality. This setup allowed for manipulation of the daughter boards to su provide support for a number of different proprietary functions. In 1983, the Apple IIe and one year later, the Apple IIc, which came as a portable, uh, in a portable con configuration, sort of, um, were the first Apple Apples that I was privileged to support in a school setting. Apple computers came with their own proprietary version of an operating system, which over time developed into a highly innovative OS. And currently, Apple is known as much for the OS as for the aesthetic design of its machines and for the quality of the hardware um, that it runs on. Please see a brief history of Apple by viewing the video clip that's found at the link that is shown on the screen. The story of IBM PC and the rise of Microsoft is very well told in the video that is linked at the bottom, or you can see the link at the bottom of this particular slide. Much of the time in this video clip is spent uh, in this very long series is used to outline the document of the LTER and Apple. In order to save time, I suggest you skip directly to timestamp 110, that is one hour and 10 minutes in, and view to the end of the first video. It's approximately seven or eight minutes. The second video is all about the development of Windows and the development of OS 2 by IBM. If you have time, briefly review both of the linked videos. The link to the second video can be found in the description below the first video in YouTube. They are both well worth your time. Note, while the early Apple machines offered color display on CRT monitors, note, that monochrome, mo note the monochrome colors of the early IBM PCs and the clones. These were available primarily in amber or green only. Another thing, thing to note is the uh, role of Apple in the development of Microsoft Windows. Some of the original sharing of ideas and innovations, which was present during the initial days of the creation of personal computers, still lingers. Instead of finding it in places like Cop Cupertino, California, or Boca Raton, Florida, it can be detected in online communities like SourceForge.net. And you can see the link to SourceForge.net at the bottom. SourceForge is sort of a business incubator in that it represents online communities who present their development projects under the banner of open source program development. Open source pro software projects offer their source code to the general public 
usually using some sort of licensing such as the GNU, General Public License, to copy, use, study, change, and improve the software, but it is offered free of charge. This is similar to the way this video clip is made freely available to the public through YouTube under a Creative Commons license. The community becomes responsible for the development and the maintenance of the software in an open source environment. As can be seen on this slide, a wide variety of operating systems have been developed under this model. Linux is probably the most, most widely known of the open source operating systems, and versions of this, for instance, Ubuntu and Red Hat, are examples of the open, open source operating systems that have been modified to support certain industries and groups of people. To some extent, open source programs have developed, uh, as they developed, eat, has eaten into the business plans of Microsoft and to Apple. Other open source projects such as Android, Mozilla For Firefox, and OpenOffice continue to offer mainstream alternatives to the offerings of those uh, proprietary companies. While the following reference is technically not theoretical in nature, it provides an effective and relatively brief overview to some of the issues and how they were addressed in the development of operating systems. And please see the Wikipedia page that is linked on this page. That brings us to the synthesis questions for this video clip, and they are as follows. Number one, the developmental history of operating systems, or OSs, seems to follow a trend from no to relatively no OS to the development of increasingly sophisticated operating systems to the current situation where, while the operating system is present, particularly in um, mobile devices and in, um, in the soon-to-be-released Windows 8, where while the operating system is present, the OS is very much in the background and seems to be transparent. Can you account for this trend? Number two, why is the open source movement important to the general public? And number three, what advantages does Apple Inc. have over companies such as Microsoft as a result of controlling the development of both hardware and software? And why is this important? That brings us to the end of the synthesis questions and to the end of this video clip.